language, thought, and culture grow up together. They shape each other, they form each other. And so they create in all native speakers habits of thinking that become difficult to uh, shed. It becomes difficult to learn new habits. And so as long as we're in the control of those habits, it's gonna be difficult to think outside the box. Our language will affect how we think. Our culture will affect how we think and how we behave. But if we get experience with other cultures and we get experience with other languages, we start to see beams of light that allow us to sort of do this kind of interplanetary travel, this intercultural travel to learn how other people think. But even if we never do that, the thoughtful person reflecting in a dark room alone can overcome the boundaries of their language if they are thoughtful enough. Welcome to The Story of Language, an original podcast series about language, linguistics, cognition, and culture. My name is Christian Saunders, and I am an English teacher, and throughout this series, I will be in discussion with Dan Everett, linguist, anthropologist, philosopher, and author. In this episode, we talk about linguistic relativity, the idea that the languages we speak can change the way we think. If you would like to contact us, you can find us on Twitter at Story of Language, or you can send us an email at storyoflanguage at gmail.com. This is episode four of The Story of Language. The general public, they they know it from kind of popular culture like maybe they've watched the film Arrival and so they have this kind of extreme science fiction view of 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 linguistic relativity and then within within the professional field of linguistics i i kind of get the impression that it's something that nobody really wants to talk about because it's something which is maybe a topic which is makes you seem a bit maybe crazy or or it's a sensitive subject right well it shouldn't be because it's a hugely scientifically important area um some people and and there's a large group of them believe that linguistic relativity had its day it was proven to be false and they've moved on from there steven pinker says pretty much this in one of his books uh he's He's criticized linguistic relativity a lot of times, but actually, actually there's still a lot to be said. So you find uh, researchers today like uh, Stephen Levinson uh, in, in Europe and John Luce at the University of Chicago and Dan Slobin at UC Berkeley and, um, and Lyra Boroditsky at uh, UC San Diego and my son Caleb. Uh, who's probably written the best book on the subject, uh, who's at the University of Miami. Um, linguistic relativity started uh, with um, uh, Edward Sapir. Um, and well, actually it goes back farther. It goes back to German philosophers, Heider and, and others. So it goes back a long ways. A lot of people have noticed that there is some sort of correlation between culture and language. Um, it can go both ways. This is something that's missed. Culture kind of fit. So you always have this chicken or egg, egg thing. Do people lack words for X because as some sort of accident and therefore their culture doesn't have it? Or does their culture not value having words for X and so they don't have words for X? Um, but but Sapir taught this stuff in his courses at Yale uh, back in the 30s. And one of his students, uh, Benjamin Lee Wharf, um, who actually was hired to teach for Sapir when Sapir went on sabbatical, uh, later became an insurance claims adjuster for Hartford Insurance. Um, and he noticed that people would talk about things after accidents that indicated that maybe their speak, the way they talked about things led to the accident. So he found that people where they had stored uh, petroleum or gasoline in barrels out behind 
a factory, consider them all empty. And they said, you know, the barrels are empty, but they're not empty. They're full of gasoline vapor. So you toss a match out there and they'll blow up. That's even more flammable than gasoline, um, the liquid gasoline. Um, so he started thinking about this and he started reading about Hopi and, and other uh, indigenous languages that uh, Sapir and others had mentioned to him. And he came up with a more elaborate, um, um, more stridently stated view of linguistic uh, relativity. Um, but there are two versions of linguistic relativity. There's linguistic determinism. And there are times when both Worf and Sapir seem to take that view, which is that Language is a straitjacket that creates for us a, a way of seeing the world that is inviolable. Once you've learned that language, that's the way you think about the world. It determines the way you think. I don't know anybody who believes that anymore. Um, there is the other view, view of linguistic uh, effects on, on culture, which is linguistic relativity, uh, the way it's practiced today, which is that it can exercise effects, our language can exercise effects on the way that we think, but they can always be overcome. These effects can be overcome. So uh, Levinson's group, you know, when I first started working with the Pinaha, I assumed that a lot of the, you know, I just assumed everybody had the same words for everything. And if they didn't, then I was wrong. I hadn't found it yet. And if I said they didn't have it, that was racist. Um, so I, I was trying to get words for left hand and right hand in, in Pinaha, and I couldn't get it. I couldn't get the words left hand and right hand. And I, so I would call other Pinaha over and work with them and try to show them. And then I would even say in Portuguese, mão esquerda, mão direita. And they would say hand, other hand. But they would never say left hand. So I said, they just must not have this. And I'm, so then I'm out in the jungle, and this is why observation is so important. I'm out in the jungle walking with them. And I said, I'll find out what it is today, because if somebody tells somebody to turn, they're going to say, turn to the left or turn to the right. And so we're getting there, and the guy says, we're, we're walking way out in the jungle. And he says, which way was the path? Which path were we going to take? And they said, upriver. They didn't say right. So then he would be walking. They say, no, turn up river. Um, so then I realized and, and verified it that they never used the terms left and right. They always used the terms up river, down river, to the jungle, to the river. Um, so you always have to have a sort of mental map of where the river is. And then I uh, took a Piraha out to uh, the city of Porto Velho. He had never been out of the jungle before in his life. And the plane flew out, we landed, and we drove to the um, to my house in the city of Porto Velho. And he asked me where on the way to the house, he said, where's the river? You know, I didn't realize at the time, he's got to know where the river is to know where he is. So he saw the river and, and I, you know, because I actually lived very close to the Madeira River at the time. And so then we had coffee, but he was really sick. So then I took him to the hospital and and he got in the hospital and they put on the hospital gown all open in the back with no underwear on. Not that he would have had underwear anyway. Um, and uh, I, I, after, I, after a couple hours, I said, well, I'm going to go home now. The doctor wants you to stay here. He said, yeah, I don't want to stay here. I said, but the doctor says you need to stay here. He said, there were other indigenous peoples in this wing of the, he said, I know they're cannibals. They're going to eat me as soon as you leave. And I said, I don't think they're going to eat you. I said, you're going to be okay, you know, because I don't want to stay. They eat people. I know they eat people. You know, he's never seen them in his life, but uh, it's it's kind of funny. But anyway, uh, I, I said, well, the doctor says you have to stay here. So I left. And it's late in the afternoon. We came all the way out of the jungle and we went, you know, so it's late in the afternoon. Uh, so first thing in the morning, there's this pounding on the door and I open it and there he is standing there in his hospital gown, uh, naked except for that, no shoes on. And he had walked uh, 30 kilometers from the hospital to my house and he's never been out before in his life. And he knew exactly how to get there because of the river and his knowledge of where we were relative to the river. Um, 
and this has been corroborated or you know confirmed by experiments in by Stephen Levinson's group at the Max Planck Institute in Nijmegen, um, in which they've shown that people who come from an absolute directional system, like upriver, downriver, to the jungle, or north, south, east, west, uh, which I'll get back to because we do have north, south, east, west in English, but nobody uses it. Um, so. Um, People who come from a directional system like that function better in new environments um, in terms of orienting themselves than people who come from a language with relative directional terms like left and right, because my right as we face each other right now is your left and your left is my right. So um, this, this, is a very, this is a very funny, funny thing that that uh, they do this, but I had already confirmed this years before they did their experiments in Nijmegen with this guy who left the hospital. I mean, I could have never gone to a new city and walked 30 kilometers, and I could have, but I would have been doing it another way. I would have been memorizing street signs and asking directions. But he spoke no Portuguese whatsoever, so he was unable to ask anyone directions. And nobody would have known where Danielle's house was because there's, you know, got to be a hundred thousand people with that name, or or at least dozens uh, out there. So, um, so that was a pretty good example of it. So, linguistic relativity. Um, most people don't take it to mean determinism; that it absolutely shapes it. Now, Sapir called language a straitjacket, so he did seem to take at times this deterministic view, but. Um, in, in Caleb's book, my son's book, Linguistic Relativity, um, he uh, does a series of experiments. And in those experiments, he does show when you have to think quickly and work quickly that your language does affect the way that you, you act. On the other hand, if you think about science, and you th to take a word like quark, you know, M Murray Gell-Mann, the physicist, came up with the word for quark. I mean, he, he took it out of uh, James Joyce's uh, novel, um, Finnegan's Wake. And, uh, and so he, he just used this term that nobody had used for a particle that he had discovered that nobody knew about. So he was going beyond his language. So he found something that there was no, no way to talk about in his language, and he brought in a way to talk about it. And any language can do that. The Pitahas have no words for numbers, but if they ever really wanted to talk about numbers, they could just borrow Portuguese numbers. And that's what societies have done all around the world. You find many societies that when they were first contacted were claimed to just have one, two, and many. And I wouldn't be surprised if the people who claimed that were wrong and that they actually had no numbers. Um, and then they borrowed numbers. It's not a conceptual difficulty not to have a, a, a word for something. You can always invent a word. Yeah, I think the, um, the whole idea that, and that for, I think for a lot of, a lot of people to, to discover that there are various languages in the world that, that, only, that only have cardinal directions, it kind of blows their mind to think that they don't have a word for left and right, which seems, you know, especially to European languages, it seems like something you can't live without. And, and I know there's the case of the, um, the Gugu Yimithir, and I don't know if that's a good pronunciation of the, of the language, but um, you know, I read that, so they use um, absolute directions like north and south and east and west. And I read that they, they took them into a, into a darkened room, blindfolded, and you know, there was no windows, there was no external um, cues about about direction, and they can actually point out, you know, where north is and where where west is, and so, you know, you compare that to me, for example, when I get in my car, and and Google Maps says um, head west, and I, I I have no idea which way is west, honestly, like, and so, and so the question is, um, maybe maybe it's not so much that language changes the way you think, but maybe the language you speak gives you more practice at a particular thing? Well, I think that's about right. You know, language gives us, because the culture organizes the world for us in a particular way, and the language in that sense sort of follows the culture and reflects what the culture wants, um, 
that this is what I call dark matter of the mind. We grow up thinking in terms of certain categories. I mean, some of it we have names for and some of it we don't, but we, we you know, for example, the pitahas stand with their arms crossed in front of them and their legs crossed when they're standing, whereas we just stand with our arms to our side. Now, they don't always stand that way, but that's a very common posture and um really like 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 this with the legs yeah, yeah they stand like this with their legs crossed and i asked you know i was telling my wife about that and she said she's a scuba diver and i'm not and she said well that's how you dive because it it brings about less resistance in the water and um i thought oh yeah that's why i'm always falling in the jungle because they're walking like this through all these narrow paths and i'm just swinging my arms and banging into everything and you know, coming probably very close to getting bit by snakes and stuff. So they um, they couldn't explain to you why they do that, and they don't have a word for it, but that's just the habit of standing that effectively uh, matches their environment. It reminds me of that it reminds me of that great story that you that you tell in your book about how you took you took some Peter Hahn to the city and they walked in single file. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, and, and again, this is another thing like for, 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 I think, a majority of people, you know, especially if you're walking in a group, you want to talk to them. So you want to stand next to them. And right. the idea of walking in single file is so bizarre. Yes. But there's no room to walk any other way in the jungle, in these jungle paths. I mean, even if it's cut with a machete, it's a lot easier to walk single file than to cut some wide path in the jungle that will also scare away the game animals. They don't want the paths to be any larger than they absolutely have to be. Um, so this is an example of culture controlling um, us, what I call dark matter of the mind, um, lightly controlling. I mean, there's we, we're independent cognitive beings. We can always overcome our environment. But for most people, imitation is always easier than innovation. So we don't invent a new language just because we want to be unique. In fact, we learn the language of the people we're trying to talk to because we don't want to be unique linguistically or we couldn't communicate. We don't want to be unique culturally or we couldn't act like everybody else does. We couldn't get by. So, so we get in the habit of acting this way and the habit of uh, thinking that way. I mean, Peirce said that the, uh, Charles Peirce said that the whole world is made of habits and that, um, um, he was a great scientist and physicist, so he didn't mean this in, in the way most of us would think that he meant it, but he would say, you know, rocks fall to the earth because that's their habitual behavior. Um, and so, um, I mean, he knew about gravity. In fact, he was one of the first people to point out potential problems with Newton's theory of gravity that were the sort of anticipated Einstein. So um, he said that that the mind is the is the result of habits and that the universe is congealed mind wow that's deep <laughs> it's very deep stuff um but um but in a sense then we all um our we our mind is manifested through our habits uh, most of the time for most of us so most people you can predict what they're going to say you know you have these formulaic exchanges and and there's not a lot of new stuff. And that's one thing that makes writing challenging because you want to use these cliches that we use in everyday speech. And the writing just suffers terribly when you do that. Trying to come up, trying to be able to say something without using, a, you know, one of your comfortable cliches or old expressions is really hard, hard to do. And, and great writers do it. Um, and mediocre writers like me struggle with it and don't do it as well. Um, and poor writers don't care. They don't even notice this fact, you know, it's not a problem for them. Well, I've actually, I've been reading a little bit about the free choice principle versus, uh, idiom, um, choice, I think principle and that, I mean, that kind of, it blows my mind, you know, because in, in the work, they sort of show that, um, most of conversation, most of what we produce is kind of formulaic and these kind of fixed expressions. You know, it's not original at all. Roger Schenk, who was one of the pioneers of um, artificial intelligence and computational linguistics, um, developed programs like this that could, um, he said, basically people talking 
they just say the same thing over and over. You could train computers to do this really well. So a lot of computer interactions are based on exactly on exactly that. Although the philosopher John Searle, um, when he spoke to Shank's group, you know, he said um, that's where he gave the famous Chinese room experiment and said that you can manipulate language without having any understanding of it. And and so Shank had this. They had these scripts where they would predict how people would behave in restaurants and whether they, what they would say and whether they would pay for things. And, and so this guy in the script, he, he served a burnt hamburger and he gets up and he walks out angrily and they ask, did he pay for the hamburger? And the computer says, no, he didn't pay for it. And Searle said, let me ask him a question. Did he stick the hamburger in his ear? I don't know. Did he wear it as a hat? I don't know. So he said, see, there's this, all this background information that people actually do have. And the fact that they talk in scripts doesn't mean this background information, which I call dark matter of the mind, is not there. I saw I saw this great because um, because sometimes I read um, forums about computer programming. It's kind of like a ho- it's a hobby of mine. And and there was this this funny story about um if, if you're a Q, if you're a Q&A tester, so, you know, your job is to test the quality of your code. Um, and you and imagine you're writing a code for, 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 the, for the till at a restaurant. So the, the QA tester goes in and he orders one beer and then he orders 10 beers. Then he orders 5,796 beers. Then he orders minus one beer. And then they say, okay, it works perfectly. And then the first real customer comes in and says, where's the toilet? And the whole fucking thing explodes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You, you don't, you know, and so the programmers responded to Searle, we'll just program more data into it. And he said, no, but the point is the data is unlimited. Humans can learn and, and are always learning. And so the data is unlimited and, and culture shifts. It's dynamic. And I say this in Dark Matter of the Mind, culture is always shifting and it's not the same today that it was yesterday. And so humans exist in that environment. But still, the two great forces are innovation and imitation, and imitation is what, if, if the solutions your culture has worked out and the solutions your language has worked out work, there's no need, it's a waste of your time to innovate. You're, you simply could use your time on other things. But if the environment changes, and the culture is no longer providing a solution. Let's say there's climate change, and suddenly uh, in in Africa it's 30 below, whatever, whether you know Celsius or Fahrenheit doesn't matter. Well, then the clothes they wear don't work anymore. Uh, so now somebody has to innovate and come up with other clothes. And in the meantime, a lot of people are going to die until this innovation spreads throughout the culture, which would probably be pretty quickly. Um, so. So um, we don't invent new words unless our culture needs them. You know, we just imitate, you know, but so, so people make too big a deal out of the fact that this culture lacks the word for this, you know, I mean, or the, or the myth that Eskimos have a lot more words for snow than we have, which is, which is not true. But, but, you know, so take the Pita Honda. Here's a really good anti-linguistic relativity effect. The Pita ha have no words for colors. They describe colors. But if you if you give them the Munsu color chips, which for many years were the standard, the sorting those chips was, was the standard and distinguishing among them was the standard way for telling, uh, a, you know, for, te- for understanding color discrimination cross-culturally, they'll do as well as anybody. And they have no words for colors. So how do they, how are they able to distinguish all these things? Because it's simply false to say that your language makes your eyes stop working. <laughs> you, you can still see this stuff even if you can't name it. You know, I the the pitaha come to me and they'll point to something in the sky and and it's moving. And so I realize, well, that's either the space station or a satellite. I never saw it. You don't see these things in the city, but you see them in the Amazon. And so, okay, so they don't know what that is, but they know that it's there. And they ask me about it and what's the name for it, you know? And I'll say, you know. In Pinaha, you know, it's, but with the English word space shuttle, you know, so there's Pinaha sentence with space shuttle in it, and they'll change that immediately laughing because they find new words from English, you know, very humorous. Uh, And so they'll change it. So it might be, 
show, you know, they may, who knows what they're going to call the shuttle, but uh, it doesn't fit their sound patterns. They'll make it fit and they'll enjoy saying it. They'll, everybody's going to be walking around, pointing to the sky in the broad daylight, call, saying, look, I see it up there. And they're laughing. They think it's really funny. Uh, but it doesn't mean they can't think about these things. They just, their culture never needed a word for it. And now they have one. Yeah. I mean, I think um, definitely there's a lot of kind of anecdotal evidence right anecdotal evidence from people especially from bilingual people who'll tell you something like um i'm a different person when i speak in french or like in italian i'm much more assertive and you know what what about this aspect of relativity yeah well it's got to be studied right um it, it's got to be studied um, and people can't simply say i mean what does that mean it's like i speak faster in italian than i speak in english well that's not true because most languages are spoken at the same speed. I mean, it's just false to say I speak faster in this language. It may be you speak different in Italian because you don't know all the words, you know, so you're doing a lot more gesturing and you don't realize you're doing more gesturing because your vocabulary is deficient. Um, it could be true. Maybe you do become a different person, but I don't become a woman if I start using different pronouns. Uh, I mean, so there clearly are limits uh, to this kind of... Uh, this kind of thing. And like all assertions, this has to be verified empirically. The thing about uh, Caleb Everett's book is that he does do a lot of experimentation of claims like this. And John Lewis's book, books um, go into this in detail. And the people at the Max Planck uh, for Psycholinguistics in Nijmegen have done lots of experiments on this stuff. So I think that there are moderate effects of linguistic relativity that can be easily overcome by a thinking individual who's got time to reflect on a problem. It's interesting that you that you raised this uh, the the idea of the Eskimos having fifty or five hundred words for snow because that that's a really popular one and that that one doesn't seem to want to die. That's because when a phrase matches cultural values, we like it. And one cultural value is that other people are really exotic. Um, you know, it's not like they're different and they've developed a perfectly functioning ecosystem in which they move and have their being. Uh, but no, no, they, they, they're just totally exotic in the way they think about the world. And so they see snow differently than we see snow. I doubt that. that I doubt that. Um, they're, they're cold and they don't want to be cold and wet any more than we do. So they come up with good solutions for the snow, but English has a lot of words for snow and we can make up all the words we want if we need it. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think though for most people, and it sort of gets back a little bit what you were saying before, is there's this kind of popular idea that if you don't have a word for something, then you can't really kind of think about it. There's, you know, people think that there's, there's this one-to-one -one relation between thinking and language. And, you know, you'll find that in a lot of, in a lot of work from, you know, from, from the kind of generative um, grammar yeah. school of thinking that, you know, that, um, that thinking is language, right? Yeah, it's just school. I wouldn't know. I don't know. Not necessarily a school of thinking, but, uh, <laughs> but the, uh, yeah, the, one of the things that amazed me when I first said that the Pidaha syntax didn't have recursion, and it still amazes me, is that people thought, you're saying they can't think recursively. That's racist. Because obviously everybody has to think recursively. And it never occurred to me that that would be a conclusion that people drew. I'm talking about the syntax. I'm not talking about the thought. But for a lot of people, the thought and the syntax just are the same. So if you're saying they lack something in their syntax, you're saying they lack it in their thought. There are all kinds of studies that I find moderately ridiculous that are like this. So you have... Um, the, the claim, and I won't mention any names, that if you have future tenses, you're more likely to save your money than if you don't have future tenses. Yeah, that's not true. I mean, that's just silly. Um, you, the, there's evidence for it, but there's a lot of evidence to the contrary. And well, actually, I think we should. I think we should talk a little bit about that because um, the, the guy responsible for that, Keith Chen. You know, he did a TED talk and it got millions of views. But then, but then, of course, they, <laughs> but then, of course, he teamed up, he teamed up with some people from the soft sciences. And when they factored in culture, it all kind of disappeared. Yeah, of course. There's no surprise to this. It's just BS from start to finish. Anybody who's done serious linguistics field research knows that anybody can think anything. Uh, they may not say it, however. 
you know, um, you know, the Pitaha, for example, they don't have a word for the future. They have a few time words. They don't have future tense. But they have all kinds of ways of dividing up time. And okay, so you could say, well, they don't have a future tense. Do they do they preserve their food? They don't save money because they don't have banks. But do they preserve their food for the future? And the answer is not the way you think. Um, because no, they, they know how to smoke meat, they know how to salt meat, but they don't do it. Um, so they don't save food. You, you're not gonna find piles of salted meat or you know, lots of nuts gathered together for the winter or something. There is no winter in the Amazon, but you're not gonna find this kind of stuff. So what do they do? They know the jungle well enough to know that they don't have to save any kind of plant material because all kinds of fruits and nuts are available 365 days a year, one or the other. Second, as long as I'm taking, bringing in food and giving it to my fellow pitahas, they will bring in food and give it to me. So there's no need to save up anything. They don't have a word for future and they don't save, but those two facts are totally unrelated, I believe. And it's just the fact that their environment is rich and they're very, very competent at using their environment. That means they don't need to save. They simply don't, don't need to save. Um, you know, my dad had a future tense and he never saved anything. I mean, a chin would, would allow for those kinds of exceptions, but the fact that nobody I knew in my immediate family you know, had a savings account, as far as I know, um, is simply because they like to drink on the weekends. And uh, that has nothing to do with their future tense or not. Uh, just uh, you got a nine to five job and you want to use any extra money for beer. In fact, not just extra money, but all your money if you have to. Uh, so, so often we didn't have groceries in the house because my future tense speaking dad spent all his money at the bar and gambling on pools. So that has nothing to do with his language. Um, so, and, and that's the other thing is that a lot of people fail to realize that the language is an output of culture and that the language is just the way the culture wants it to be. And it's not the culture is the way the language just coincidentally happens to be. That's my perspective on it. And, and, uh, and, and this, so the, some people say, well, you, it, sometimes the language affects the culture and sometimes the culture affects the language. I think that, and I, I, try, I bring this out a little bit in Dark Matter of the Mind, but I think that it's, it's pretty much just culture affects language. And then those two together affect our cognitive habits and the way that we perform. Um, and, and so, you know, linguistic relativity exists, uh, but I think that it is epiphenomenal. I think that the real factor is how does culture emerge, how does language emerge from culture? And this is the real crucial issue. And uh, many linguists today simply find that to be an uninteresting question or a question based on a misconception of what language is. What we do as humans is the result of what we've learned from other humans and how we, you know, cogitate about all of that in our brain and think about it and express it. And there are no shortcuts to that. And reading headlines in the New York Times on the internet is not the same as reading an in-depth study that's very sound empirically about the phenomena that you're reading about. And you know, I've heard celebrities say, I don't read books because there are films now and I can get it all from films. That's not true. You know, and I've, there's not going to be um, a, tr a movie made that's, you know, tr Kant's transcendental idealism, which affected the American um, pragmatist, but also the American transcendentalist, you know, from Emerson then to Peirce. Um, there could be a movie made about that, I suppose, if somebody really went, nobody would watch it except a few, and nobody would understand it unless they also read the book. Uh, so. Uh, these are these are really there's some really complicated ideas out there that take a lot of time to reflect, and not just nonfiction science either. Some of the most important work in fiction, you know, say Dostoevsky or my American favorite these days, Jim Harrison. Um, these guys and women, you know, uh, did the hard work of thinking deeply about the human condition, and so I find sometimes that. I learn more about the about 
the human condition through fictional literature than I do through empirical psychology, even though I certainly respect and read a lot of empirical psychology. A good writer, but these aren't people who, who simply uh, write in dribs and drabs. Um, they, they have to have some serious thought behind all the writing. Sometimes people confuse the writing process with the thinking that goes, you know, I wrote language, the cultural tool. The first half of the book took me a year. The second half of the book took me five days. I went to a cabin in Maine and I wrote the whole, like almost 200 other published pages in five days, working from 5 a.m. to 11 p.m. while my wife went out and did tourism and, and we went out in the evenings for dinner um, because I knew what I wanted to say. I had thought about it long enough, so now it was just a matter of getting it on paper. So it wasn't like I was just thinking through all this stuff. It took me over a year to think about it, and then I said, okay, now I, wanna, I know what I want to say. And I, and I just did it. Um, you know, Jim Harrison said he wrote the, sh the novellas, the, the three novellas that make up Legends of the Fall, uh, which became a very successful movie. He wrote that all in five days and changed one word. Um, <laughs> He said, but I knew what I wanted to say before I sat down. And those are, those are really insightful novellas about the human, the human condition. So I think that scientists should read uh, literature. And just as I think that uh, um, literary theorists should read science. In fact, I think that's more important than the other. Well, I think it's, I think it's quite sort of telling that, that most linguists, when they, you know, their, their university department isn't language it's actually psychology and so i think there's there's this kind of um this this rela this relationship between you know how the mind works and thinking and language you know they're all interconnected right yeah except that as sapir said who's my great idol of all linguists he is my my idol um that psychology was a branch of anthropology uh, so he would have never, both linguistics and, he was against the founding of linguistics departments because he said, when you found a linguistics department, people will reify the discipline and they will want to say that it's not related to these other things. But we know that language comes out of culture and that psychology comes out of culture. Um, and even if you want to say they're in a symbiotic relationship, so they're all interconnected, that's fine. I like the messier, the more likely it is to be correct. Um, really neat solutions are probably always wrong uh, outside of two plus two equals four. And then you have to decide whether you're talking about biology or math and one plus one equals three in biology and, you know, uh, sometimes. Um, so so um, you have to know, you have to know the domain and you have to realize that things are interconnected. So there is no such thing as cognition apart from culture. Culture is the driver of cognition. The greatest thing that humans have is this unstructured plastic brain. And we're born into a society that tells us how to shape it. And if we're not born into such a society, we're, we cannot function ever. It's interesting as well, um, maybe what, what philosophy has to say about language. So for example, you've got um, someone like uh, Wittgenstein, and and his idea of um, of the the linguistic paradox, which is, you know, where where two people can think that they both understand the meaning of of a concept or a word or whatever, but actually they don't. Maybe they're thinking about the same thing in a different way. Yeah, exactly. And that's that's a problem. The interesting thing about Wittgenstein, um, he wrote the Tractatus, um, which was you know the last word in philosophy, so now he could go get a job at a soda fountain or whatever he was thinking of doing at the time because he solved a philosophy. Then this 20-something-year-old philosopher at Cambridge, one of the smartest people to have ever walked the planet, who died at 27, Frank Ramsey, comes along to Wittgenstein and says, you know, you got problems in this volume because you never considered the work of Charles Sanders Peirce. And Peirce uh, clears up a lot of the issues you need to work on. So Wittgenstein said, is that so? And so um, in his conversations with Ramsey and Russell and then reading Wittgenstein, he realized his, his theory of the Tractatus was not right. So he came out with his second book, Philosophical Investigations, which is, you know, a much better way to think about things. Not all philosophies 
philosophers would agree. But, you know, so for purse, when you have a symbol or any kind of sign, it has to be interpreted. And that interpretation is in terms of other symbols and other signs. And so it's not surprising that two people could be using different signs to interpret the same. You start off with one sign, but interpret it with other signs, other symbols, um, so that, uh, yeah, you, you, you think you're saying the same thing. I mean, there's this famous thought experiment by Hilary Putnam, one, another one of the great philosophers of the 20th century, who talked about two people from different planets, and they had this clear liquid that they could both drink, and, and it tasted the same and everything. And they both called it water. It turned out they both English developed independently, you know, so they both spoke, called it water. But it's chemically different on the two planets, so it's really not the same thing. You know, but they think it's the same thing. Um, and, and so what difference does it make? Does it make any difference at all? And this is a really interesting philosophical problem. You know, truth, at what level is the truth told? You know, I, I like to say for the Pitaha, the truth is finding food, taking care of your family, um, but other things that we consider fundamental to truth, they don't. Is the truth of I would like a glass of water that I want something with the composition H2O? Or could it be that I want something that tastes like water? I don't care what its physical composition is. So there's no question that at one level, I just want water. And another level, it, you know, we, we're talking about H2O. So, so where is truth? Where is language in all of this? And if we both call the same substance water, even though, I mean, if we both call different substances water, does that What's, where's linguistic relativity in that? Yeah, I think there's also, I mean, if, you know, a much more sort of um, maybe a simple kind of uh, thought experiment specifically about language is, um, you know, I've seen some presentations where um, they, they will ask a group of students to um, explain what a chair is, like what's a chair. And so the students will try to give definitions like, you know, it has four legs, it's designed for sitting on. But then there's also included in that definition there's other things that are not chairs like a horse has four legs and you could sit on it right um and you know so this this kind of idea that we only know what words and concepts mean not not actually by learning it explicitly but just through our experience of being alive that 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 kind of blows my mind a little bit i mean you can if you watch a, a fantasy movie and people are sitting in these chairs and then at night the chairs move around and talk to each other. Are those still chairs? Uh, you know, so we assume the chairs are inanimate objects too. All of this is comes to us through our culture and our interactions with one another, even unspoken things. You know, what is what does a baby know when it's born? Well, it knows a lot. It knows what foods its mother likes, right? Because it's getting if its mother likes a lot of garlic, uh, I assume my mother did because I'm addicted to garlic. Um, but uh, it, it has an unconscious knowledge of these things. It knows that its mother gets afraid and has some idea of how its mother reacts when it's afraid. It hears its mother's intonation. It may not be able to pick out the, con you know, it's sort of insulated from hearing really well, but it can get the intonation. So after nine months in the womb, a child is not born a blank slate, even if you're John Locke. It's born, it, meant a, it was a blank slate when it was a gamete. You know, but now that it's uh, outside the womb, it's uh, it's it knows a lot of stuff when it comes out, um, and that's part of society. We we are the most social creatures that have ever lived. Uh, more, we need each other more than chimps need each other or wolves need each other. Uh, humans can't live without each other, and we need a way to communicate, and that's language, and and our cultures affect the way you know we talk like who we talk with. That's the simple rule of all languages, you know, and all dialects. You talk like who you talk with. And if the people you're talking with don't talk about a certain subject, neither will you. But that doesn't mean you can't learn it. <laughs> it's funny because, um, you know, in the field that I specifically work in, this, this, this creates a bit of a problem for people who want to learn English because, um, unfortunately, most people have this idea that they want to be like a native speaker. And, and I spend a lot of my time telling people, well, you can't because you're not. 
a native speaker. And, you know, a native speaker is a result of all of the experiences of their life. That's exactly right. That's the point that people miss. I tell, you know, if you're studying these language programs, like, you know, whatever the latest computational promise to learn the language in six weeks um, and all this BS, um, it, it is learning to to live in that culture and know how to express things in that culture. You know, I mean, when I was learning Portuguese and, you know, I mean, I'm, we're still all learning every language, but when I was first learning Portuguese, I would, I would think I had the verbs, you know, a star and ser figured out. I mean, this is what bothers every American. Why do they do this to us, you know, with these distinctions? And then, then you think you have it figured out. And I remember watching a soccer match on television and I had learned, I thought I really knew how to use these verbs and I was correcting other Americans and I was always a pain in the ass. And, and so then they, the announcer says, Guarani, who was that year the champion of Brazil in soccer said, Guarani é o melhor time e está o melhor time. What the hell does that mean? He's both ser and a star to describe them. And, that really bothered me, you know, and then I realized, oh, it depends on the perspective you're taking. It's not just a matter of, of the verb meaning X. It is the verb means X and that and X will be required under one perception of the same event and not required under the Everest. Uh, you know, it's the same thing with the, with the um, progressive aspect. You know, you can say, you know, most Americans struggle with knowing whether to say, Eu estava comendo, or eu estive comendo. You know, the, I, I was punctilier, estive, and I was, you know, durative, estava. And that depends on how you're perceiving it. There's no right, you know. Yeah, that's exactly. I mean, I get, I get emails from students all the time saying, you know, if I'm talking about going to the cinema yesterday, should I use past simple or past continuous or present perfect? And my reply is, well, that, that's, that's a question you need to ask yourself. That's your perspective. How, how do you want to talk about it? Exactly. That, yeah, and that's, that's the thing. Language is designed to help facilitate the expression of our cultural values, knowledge structures, and social roles. And, and so language is at our service. It is our greatest technology. But you can't know how to use a technology unless you understand the culture in which that technology is being used. I mean, I can give a pitaha a, a screwdriver and they can find a ton of uses for it that has nothing to do with tightening screws because they don't have any screws. So if I want to say there's a correct way to use a screwdriver, which actually there isn't, however it works, is fine, you know. But, uh, but if, if I want to say we use it to do this and so it only means that, that's obviously wrong. And a word is no different than a screwdriver. <laughs> actually, there's there's the famous um, uh, the famous story of I can't actually remember his name, but he was a really famous American um, blues guitarist. To him, the secret to writing a good blues song was in three parts, and so and in each three part you have a knife. So in in the in the first part of the song, you um, use the knife uh, to to shave so that you look good for your girlfriend. Yeah. And in the second verse of the song, you use your knife to, to cut bread with, so that you have energy when you go to see your girlfriend. And then when you get to your girlfriend's house, she's sleeping with another guy and you use the knife to murder him, right? Yeah. So this, this object has these three, you know, really distinct kind of cultural uses. Exactly, and, and so that, that's exactly the same with words and expressions, idiomatic expressions, the way that we choose to view things and what makes what makes fictional writing so significant to our culture is that, and especially poetry, is people figure out new uses for these tools called words. And they teach us about these words that we have. I'm currently, as I drive to work, since I live so far away from work, I'm always listening to biographies. And I'm currently listening to the biography of the English poet Philip Larkin and how he decided to write poems and what he wrote poems about and how he liked to use words and, and things and, um, you know, his jealousy of other writers and how they used words. And, and uh, once you start to see language as this incredible tool that's so fluid and 
so easy. Most of what we study in, I, I don't want to overgeneralize, a lot of what is studied in, in books like David Adger's is, are these formulaic structures that are habits. And so it's basically a study of our linguistic habits, but it's not a study of our linguistic freedom and all the variation that can happen. And it's not a study of meaning. I mean, I reviewed David Adger's last book before this one. And, um, and what I said about it was, um, you know, generative linguists are cheerfully oblivious of the underlying connection of meaning to form. Uh, and the fact that form is there to serve meaning and not the other way around. And as long as you have that perspective, you're not, and, and where does meaning come from? Meaning comes from culture. So to the degree that anyone accepts the idea that meaning affects form, they have to also agree that culture affects form because culture is where our meaning comes from. So it's interesting that you mentioned poetry because again, this sort of gets back to this idea that you need you know, specific, you know, words or specific grammatical constructions to kind of think in a certain way. And, you know, there's, you know, there's this idea that, for example, if you really want to appreciate, you know, Dostoevsky, you really have to read it in the original language, or that there's certain poems that you just, you know, you can't, you can't translate them. But so where's this kind of balance between, you know, thought and language and, and this sort of gray area? Well, they're, they're, you know, the components of language are sound structure, meaning structure, and grammar structure. And most of us write um, in such a way that we're just trying to get across the meaning and the form as of secondary importance. So um, I like to think that I've done a good job writing my books, but I also believe that you can understand about language evolution the way I've written about it. You know, my books coming out in lots of languages, I bet it's not that hard always to translate. But if I were trying to translate Dostoevsky or I were trying to translate a Bible, maybe let's, yeah, I mean, I did try to translate the Bible, but if you're really trying to translate a poem, the poem is probably the greatest example in human endeavor of trying to perfectly marry form and meaning. And those, and the greatest authors I think are people who've also accomplished that. The, the perfect, as perfect as we can make it, marriage of form and meaning. So it's not like form is the secondary thing. They have chosen the form, the, the length of the sentences, the um, complexity of the noun phrases, the alliterate, you know, the initial consonants of the words so that it produces this pattern that exactly um, presents the meaning. It presents the meaning far more precisely. Once you get that kind of perfect marriage in a particular culture, in a particular language, and it becomes impossible to translate exactly that because once we go to another culture, we might be able to get the meaning across, but we can no longer get that same. The best translators, I think, try to do this in another language. So they say, why did Dostoevsky choose sentences of this length? How can I do this in English? You know, so they're not just trying to get across, oh, Two plus two equals four. So how do we say that in English? You know, you just say it however we say it in English. They're doing something more sophisticated. That's why the best translations are works of great intellectual achievement. Uh, they're not simply rendering somebody else's, you know, some Enigma code. That, you know, the Enigma machine is is so stupid compared to human translation. You know, it is just cracking that code although it was mathematically complex, is trivial compared to translating Dostoevsky into English. Um, and, and that's what's hard for a lot of people to grasp because you're going for that, that marriage. And I, I think poetry is probably the hardest thing. I love the poetry of uh, Pablo Neruda, for example, and I have read it in, in Spanish and English. And... Um, I'm not a native speaker of Spanish. I mean, you know, I read Camões, who's Brazil, you know, Portuguese is Shakespeare, Camões. And so now there, when you read it in Portuguese, you know that you're experiencing something different than you are when you read it in English. So I don't think that all books matter. They can be translated and understood just fine. But the best books, it does matter. For me, I was kind of shocked to discover that 
and and this this is shows that the the depth of my ignorance <laughs> but i was shocked to discover that um that in a lot of languages rhyming especially in poetry isn't even considered um good and it's not even considered necessary and in fact in in a lot of languages poetry doesn't rhyme it they have other kind of ways of expressing like you say this marriage between form and meaning yeah i mean when i was in bible school and we were talking about greek and hebrew and learning about translation we re we learned that in hebrew poetry at least in biblical hebrew uh, there were other structural connections that didn't involve rhyming um, that were fundamental to the poetry and to the beauty of the poetry. So chiastic forms where you go like A, B, C, D, E, and then you go E, D, C, B, A, uh, so that they sort of, you marry the parts up like this. So the whole poetry has a structure, this chiastic structure, meaning X in Greek, um, and, and so that's fascinating, but they, but language people, you know, they are trying to connect language. And so you can ask, is an author trying to connect the written form of the language or the spoken form of the language? Um, how is he or she bringing about this marriage of form and function? So um, literature is, is, is not quite the, not quite the same as saying that if somebody has a future tense, they'll save, uh, their money. I mean, th those are at different levels of, of abstraction. And, um, you know, I think that um, before you make a, a statement like that, you do have to know a lot about cultures and other reasons for their variation. Yeah, exactly. And because I know that, you know, we've talked before in a previous podcast about your kind of experiences of certain things especially like with the Pidaha, certain things became invisible to you. Like, for example, you couldn't see snakes in the jungle the same way that they could. And, right. you know, like your book, Don't Sleep, There Are Snakes, it starts with this, you know, the, the whole um, village having this, this, this kind of vision of something, even to this day, you don't know what it was. So, um, you know, I'm wondering about the connection between, between language not necessarily thought, but between language and how that could make you blind to to certain things. You take take a word in Pidaha like uh, like uh, kawaiboge, which literally means a fast mouth, fast mouth. These this term refers to creatures um, that speak in a high voice, in a falsetto, and talk very fast. Um, and wear no clothes, um, and live in the jungle and eat weird stuff, uh, not like what normal humans eat, but otherwise look just like us. So if you hear somebody speaking in that voice, even if they look like your next door neighbor, they're not your next door neighbor. You know, I, I said, well, that looks just, you know, I hear, I see these guys coming to the village naked and they're talking like this, but you know, that's just John, you know, I mean, this is not some new creature. And, and they'll say, oh, that's not him, you know, because he doesn't talk like that. Um, and so initially, as a Christian missionary, I thought about it in terms of spirits. But that doesn't fit how the Pitaha think about the world. There are no supernatural entities or just different entities. And so that also brings up the issue, are these things just their literature? Are these special creations of theirs just part of their fictional world. And then I realized even that doesn't make any sense. The, the whole fact fiction divide is carved one way for us and another way for them. And so um, fact and fiction vary according to culture, what's fact and what's fiction. Um, I don't think the Pidaha have any sense of fiction of something that's entirely made up like we do. But they do have things in which they sort of suspend their normal empirical judgments and take things at face value. Actually, there's a new book out, I haven't read it yet, by Karen Armstrong, who's one of my favorite authors on religion, in which she talks about the tendency of modern interpreters of scriptures, whether it's the Koran or the Vedas or the Bible, um, to take it all very literally. 
Whereas she argues that in the original oral traditions behind all of these scriptures, that's not how they were interpreted. They were very, very flexible. And it's, it's over the years in culture, we've tried to make it very rigid and come up with these ideas and rules of translation. So it's got to be a word for a word, which is, is silly. Um, it, it, it produces nothing but bad translations when you try to get it word for word match, you know. Um, so the, the, the whole thing is like um, the process of cultural formation and how the culture uses communicate, communicative tools to accomplish its ends and how those communicative tools come to share the properties that most languages share um, called grammar, meaning, and sound structure or visual structure. Um, but to me, when you get a solution that uh, there's, there's this one thing that's found in all languages and we can derive all everything that happens from that really simple thing, I don't think the world, the world may be simple, but I don't think we, we are capable of perceiving all of its complexity that simply. I just think that, you know, we're talking apes. We didn't have toilet paper a couple of hundred years ago. I don't know when we invented toilet paper, but we, you know, some very basic things that we take for granted today, we've lived most of our time without. We've been on Earth 0.04% um, of Earth's history. Uh, I know that because I just wrote an exam today for my students, and that's one of the questions. Um, and um, I tend to learn the exam questions as I make them up. <laughs> 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 like any good teacher. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we are not that smart. And the idea that humans are, you know, like I, I read a recent article by Chomsky where I'm also in the title and he's, it's just an interview with him about me. And he said, we are not apes. Well, there's a good place to divide me and Chomsky because we are apes. And, uh, and, and what is different between us and apes is really not that it has to do with more CCs and, and, denser neurons and better brains. I think once you get beyond that and the human skeletal structure, something that took about, it took us, took us about 6 million years uh, to split off from the chimps. And then the last 2 million years with the genus Homo. And, um, but, but we're still pretty much just classified among the prime. We're just a primate in the primate family tree. And, um, we shouldn't take ourselves much more seriously than gorillas or chips. It, it's funny, actually, when you you know when when you when you put language into into perspective like that, especially kind of you know like like in geological kind of time. Um, yeah, it, it takes on a new it takes on a new perspective. You know, for example, like writing. You know, f for anyone that sort of grows up in a in a like a Western industrialized country. The, the the connection between writing and and language is well they're considered the same thing but but out of the 7000 or so languages in the world a, a vast majority of them have never written anything down ever right and it doesn't make them uh, more primitive it simply means they've chosen not to use this tool it's like it's like the majority of cultures in the world don't use golf clubs but this doesn't mean that they're inferior because they don't play golf i mean <laughs> So, so the fact that you found some sort of tool in language and think this is what separates superior beings from inferior beings, you know, it's just, you know, everybody around the world, um, every, I don't know a society that doesn't have the bow and arrow. It won't shock me if somebody finds a society that doesn't use bows and arrows and uses blowguns. But every society has to solve the problem of how to eat protein that moves faster than you do. Right, you throw stuff at it, but if you get an more accurate tools like the bow and arrow, do you a lot of good. So it's not a big shocker to find out that everybody invents bows and arrows because we got these great brains. It doesn't occur to anyone to say, well, that's not true. It does occur to some people to say that we invent bows and arrows because we're pre-programmed genetically to have bows and arrows. You know, um, but I, I find it, you know, that's like saying we're pre-programmed to have burritos and and carburetors and and electric engines and stuff like that. I mean, these are just solutions to problems and words are the same thing. Why do we talk? Well, we talk because that's the most efficient form of communication we come up with. You know, we can keep our hands free. And then we come up with the huge shocker that our ears are somehow specially designed to pick out speech sounds. 
Well, they evolve together. You know, it's what is the big surprise that our ears can understand ourselves better than they can understand other creatures? They, you know, some of the things that are made into huge mysteries are just facts about evolution that if you really stu- stood back from it, you, you wouldn't expect to find a creature that could understand other creatures better than it can understand itself. You know, so this is, uh, this is, so so much of what scientists very often are good at, and I'm not demeaning science because I would like to think on my better days I am among that, a member of that pursuit of science. Um, they are very good at inventing, taking non-problems and making them problems. Um, so have you ever thought about this? And then they'll write, you know, five, six papers on it. But yeah, no, I never thought about it. And there's a good reason why I never thought about it. You know, I mean, there's some things that we're thinking about. The, the hardest things um, to think about are the obvious things. Like, and so why did, why did the apple fall to the ground? You know, now that's a hard problem. And, and um, you could also say, why do we have language? That's also a hard problem. But have you really answered it when you, if you say we have language because we're humans? And humans are, are designed by evolution to have language. It's not clear that you... It reminds me of the hypothesis of where did DNA come from on Earth? It either originated in the sort of nucleotide soup of the early oceans, um, or as some people call this hypothesis, panspermia, um, some meteor brought DNA here, but that doesn't help me, right? Because yeah, it's possible DNA developed somewhere else first, but how did it develop there? It's like, it's like if God created the world, that doesn't solve the problem because who created God? And if you just tell me, well, he always was, I can say, well, so was the world. Ha uh-huh. ha. So we don't need God either. Uh, I know I have to be on the world. So I, you know, um, a lot of these issues are simply because we're really good at, at uh, and we also blur the distinction between fact and fiction, between problems and non-problems. I mean, I think that everybody ought to work on what's interesting to them as long as society is willing to pay them uh, to do it, you know. I mean, I, have a, I see so many academics, I get off on a favorite tangent right now, who complain about uh, society trying to influence the university. On yeah, if society influences the university too much, the university will lose sight of its mission and become a both tech, you know, vocational training. But on the other hand, society has a right to question everything we do in the university as long as they're paying for it, right? Um, and and we can't simply say you don't have the right to interfere. They're paying the bills, so we have the re- they have the right to question, and we have the responsibility to come ready with all the answers. And if we don't have those answers, you know, like somebody said, what if, what if political party A, let's just call them Republicans for the sake of discussion, were to take over the universities and make us teach what they want us to teach? Would that be horrible? Yes. Would it be within their rights? Unfortunately, it is. You know, society pays all the bills. They can, you know... The best intellectual work of the past was not done at universities. It was done by people in dark rooms thinking hard thoughts by themselves uh, and then talk coming out once in a while to talk to other people about it. Uh, And maybe we'll be driven back to that. And I don't know that that's that's an awful thing, although I would be impoverished. I mean, if I lost my university job, I'd have to live in a trailer and work at a Taco Bell because I don't have skills that would enable me to, I don't have marketable skills. Somehow I've if the university is my market, you know, so if the university disappears, I'm, uh, I could teach, I could teach English, uh, not very well though, because it's a lot harder than it sounds, as you know so well. So I would probably just be hitting people, uh, screaming at them and hitting them. You know, it takes a lot of ability to teach things effectively as, as I've learned. You've got to be passionate about what you're teaching. But in the meantime, um, most of society's successes or failures aren't based on the types of words we chose to invent as a culture. I'm I'm wondering because we, at the very beginning, you know, I, I talked about the film um, Arrival, and I, I, I mention it because again, it's a really popular. You know, it's it's out there in popular culture. It's kind of based in this this linguistic relativity, and and in the film. 
because she learns this alien language, she's actually able to literally time travel. Right. And and so I'm wondering, you know, what, where, where, what do you think are the limits of of how the way we think can be affected by by culture? I've actually given several interviews about that movie uh, to Scientific American, NPR, and others. And I love the movie, you know, because for one thing, Amy Adams is gorgeous. So I love the movie, and she's a good actress, um, actor. Um, and, and the one part of the, about the movie that I think is fabulous is how they, how she exemplifies field research. She does field research like a real linguist. I love it. And she's got a good consultant. Actually, the director of the movie uh, took a time on Reddit and somebody asked him about me. And he said, if you look in her office, which it's, I've done this many times and it's too fast to see, there is a shelf of linguistic books and a lot of them are by Dan Everett and others are by Chomsky. We want to have both represented on the shelf, you know? So, so I, my books are at least in the movie, according to the director. In any case, the field research, um, the, there was a consultant on the movie who's a linguist in Canada and I can't remember her name, but she did a good job because the movie is really faithful to field research. The idea of linguistic relativity if you think in a circle, time will be a circle, and therefore you'll know the past and the present. Yet that's not going to happen. Um, the linguistic relativity simply means that a culture has produced um, a language that serves its needs. And if you really want to understand that culture, you have to live in that culture and learn that culture's language and all the other things that are part of that culture. Um, and and but we're all still limited by our species language doesn't get us out of our species it gives us a different cultural um uh that it's a tool i mean it's it's a hugely useful tool to know more than one culture it's it, it enriches us cognitively in just about every way but it doesn't make us non-humans because all these cultures come out of the same basic sack of bones and brains that where we are as humans. And so aliens might be able to think about the past and future. I mean, that's a philosophical issue. I suspect there are good philosophical or physical reasons why that can't be the case, but let's say it is the case. Um, we're not gonna become aliens if we learn their language. We'll know their culture, but we won't have their bodies and brains. And it all goes together. Um, can you ever really learn a dog's language? You know, Dr. Doolittle, is an interesting idea there. That's sort of the same problem as a rival. Can I think like a dog? Um, yeah, just take a hammer to your brain and beat out half of your brain. <laughs> you might be able to think like a dog. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, dogs don't have uh, the general intelligence or concentration of neurons to develop a human. It doesn't mean they don't have any kind of communication, and it doesn't mean they can't read our emotions because we share emotions with them. And we probably, maybe we would share emotions with, in fact, I don't believe it's possible to be a thinking creature of any species without emotions. And so these aliens must have had emotions. In fact, we see that they got angry and they got, a, you know, all this stuff. But yeah, um, we can't go beyond human bounds, even if we learn a non-human language. And it's possible that although any language would be based on, in my opinion, semiotics on this theory of symbols and signs, it's what a language is whether they're from Mars or from Earth or wherever they're from, um, they could have symbols that are beyond our capacity to interpret. Yeah, like maybe, well, I mean, I've sort of read some articles about some of the wild and wacky ways that aliens might communicate. Like, for example, uh, ultraviolet light, which we can't even see, or chemical, kind of chemicals that we can't detect. You know, things like that. But those are like the phonologies. Those are the sound systems. That's their speech form. We can always figure that stuff out. We can get machines that can pick out the light differences and stuff. I'm talking about once you get the form, the meaning simply may be beyond us. You know, I'm betting that it isn't. But even if you get the form, so if they speak, you know, ants communicate by chemicals. You know, and ants have very simple communication system. You know, it's like food, food here, good, you know, lots of food here, whatever, you know, 
dead worker. I mean, they, they don't have much to say. You know, E.O. Wilson probably knows as well as anybody else what they have to say. And I don't think it's go they're going to be writing any books. But, but ants do use a science system. It's chemicals, and they interpret those chemicals. So in a sense, the reason I wouldn't say they have a language is because they're using indexes and icons, and they're not using symbols. Um, but you could find another creature that use symbols that are beyond our ability to interpret, even if we got the physical form of those symbols and we could recognize, oh, that's symbol A and that's symbol B, we may not know what those mean. Uh, that's, that's an empirical question, but it isn't going to be because of grammar. We could have the same exact grammars and still not be able to talk if, if we're going across species. Yeah, I, I suppose that, that, is, that is a, a philosophical question because really it's, it's, so it's not... It, I understand what you're saying. It's not about the form. It's about the way of thinking, which could be something that we can't even comprehend, right? Yeah. I mean, um, you know, our brain is like an ant colony where all the individual neurons are ants. But what if they were literally ants? Um, you know, maybe there are creatures that walk around with heads full of ants, and it's the ants that are individually, you know, contributing. We don't know what kinds of thinking possibilities there are and whether they have to come to the same meanings we come to. I mean, we do know that they're not gonna get here if they don't figure out math. Um, they gotta have math, they gotta have, there's a lot gonna be a lot of overlap. We don't know how they entertain themselves. Maybe they entertain themselves by eating earthlings, but you know, we don't, um, but they, they probably have some, maybe they don't even have a form of entertainment. But we know they had to have math and they knew they had to have metallurgy and they had to have all these things to be able to travel here. So we already see some commonality, but that doesn't mean commonality at the same level of the species. And we already find it hard, if you're a speaker of an Indo-European language, it's much harder, if that's your native neighborhood, it's harder for you to learn a non-Indo-European language. Um, and if you're a native speaker of a non-Indo-European language, then, I mean, it's more, it's probably easy, I mean, it's undoubtedly easier for a speaker of Mandarin to learn Cantonese than it is for a speaker of Mandarin to learn, uh, you know, English or Spanish, uh, but they could still learn it. But now we're all in the same species and, you know, uh, maybe Martians couldn't even tell us apart because we're so much alike, right? Uh, but if you, um, if you go across to another species, now that's a different matter. We really don't know what it would be. That's the kind of field work I would like to do. There's actually a couple of other books that are, or, and movies that are about language that I find even more interesting. I think the greatest movie ever made about language is My Fair Lady. Uh, and that's about a phonetician. But there's also um, the book, The Sparrow by Mary Doria Russell, which is like my favorite ever linguistic field work book. It's about this team from the U.S. led by a Jesuit PhD in linguistics who are going to another planet to try to communicate because we know there's life on that planet, intelligent life. And uh, it's just great. And she gets it all right. I wrote her and I said, obviously, you've either done a lot of linguistic field research or you've talked to a lot of people who have. And uh, she said, oh, I gave a, you know, I jumped up and down with joy when you said that, because no, I never have done any, and I was hoping <laughs> I got it right, you know. Just, just, just to finish off, um, what, what, what is it that you want people to, to kind of realize about, about this whole subject of linguistic relativity and language and thought? Language, thought, and culture grow up together. They shape each other, they form each other. Um, and so they create in all native speakers habits of thinking that become difficult to uh, shed. It becomes difficult to learn new habits. Um, and so as long as we're in the control of those habits, it's going to be difficult to think outside the box. Our language will affect how we think. Our culture will affect how we think and how we behave. But if we get experience with other cultures and we get experience with other languages, we start to see glimpses, you know, uh, beams of light that allow us to sort of do this kind of interplanetary travel, this intercultural travel to learn how other people think. And, um, but even if we never do that, the thoughtful person 
reflecting in a dark room alone can overcome the boundaries of their language if they are uh, thoughtful enough. Uh, it's a lot easier though if you travel a lot and talk to a lot of people from different cultures. And I tell my students, if you got, if you went to country X and you don't like their food, you never tried their food, and you didn't learn any of their language, your, your trip doesn't mean anything. It's a wasted trip, you wasted your money um, because you learned nothing. Uh, you know, and, and oh, what I learned this and I, yeah, but that's all insignificant. You gotta learn that the, the first test for the traveler is to enjoy the weirdest things they eat. Um, and if you can't enjoy that, you've got, that just is an example. Once you learn the culture well enough, you will enjoy it. Thank you.